Okay, um, we are on the series, As a Man Thinks. As a man thinks, so is he. Um, and again, as we start off, I just want to thank God for the opportunity to be able to share his word with everyone today. Um, it still remains a privilege. It will always be a privilege to be able to be his mouthpiece, even if it's just for a few seconds, um, or a few minutes rather. And then after that, you know, I yeah, just literally atrophy into the same normal human being with all faults and everything else. But I hope that during this moment where we share God's word, you don't see me for who I am, but you just see what God is trying to say. Again, if there's anything that is said that might not come across very well with you, um, please understand it's not because I know you, it's not because the sermon was planned for you, it might just be that God is trying to speak to you. So if there's conviction in your heart, open up to it and let God speak to you. Remove all the negative thoughts, all barriers that might be there, and just open it so that as this word comes through to you, it might be a place that might be a place of refuge for you, and it might just be a good leverage point to start off as uh, somebody else or as a new chapter in your life, because we all know we are always just one decision away, one decision away from being a better person, one decision away from being a better person. Okay, so quickly, um, we'll go into what we covered last week, just as a quick recap, and the full sermon in this is available on the social media platforms. Um, B's doing a good job there, the hurlers are doing a good job. Um, he's also doing an amazing job at that, so uh, find it on Facebook, find it on YouTube. I didn't know where the YouTube channel, but find it there. Uh, then on Instagram, you'll be able to see some of the uh, quick quotes and verses that we did come up with where that's concerned. So. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We covered this and we said it's extremely important because the heart is the seat of the emotions, the thoughts and everything else, and what you do in there begins to be who you are. And we said the body will follow where the mind will go. And we said you are today who you have always thought you would be. All right, then we spoke about the, the reality that there is a battle in the mind and a battle for the mind. We still remember that. Okay, and then we said the battle in the mind is number one, the door. The devil opens a door early on in your life, something traumatic that he uses to come through into your life every now and then. Check what that might be. The number two, we spoke about the environment. It might be because of hereditary causes or it might be because of the place that you stay, but check that the devil uses that to influence you. And then we moved on to um, the battle in your mind. Number one, we spoke about the thoughts, um, how it's extremely crucial to guard your heart, because from it springs out the life that we know. And then number two, we spoke about habits, and our habits become ingrained in our minds, and how we need to peel them off layer by layer. Remember that, remove the H, remove the A, remove the B, remove the, and you still have her? You still have it, remember that. Okay, so today we're on part two, and part one was the battle. Part two is a lot lighter, today it's the promise, the promise. The promise. God has promised us amazing things in his word. And I am one of those people who has really tried to take God's word, his promises in his word, and do something with that. But I want to ask you a question. And it's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer it to me. But is there ever a promise in the word of God that you've read and say to yourself, uh, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Has that ever happened to you? Or has every promise you've read in the Bible has been like, oh, yeah, that's possible. I know that for my life, I'm applying it, I'm going to do it. Have you ever doubted on something God has said? Okay, there's a verse I didn't want to say, but I'm sure those of you who've read it know about it, which says, if a man says to this, Mountain, be removed and... Be, oh, Glenn, I can see Glenn. Like, <laughs> I'm still trying to crack it till today. Like, do you literally mean like a mountain? Like if I could go to a mountain, I'm like, hey, mountain. Yeah, me, man, me, you, mountain. You move into sea. The Bible says it'll be done for you. Now, I don't know about you, but there's some promises which when I write down, I'm like, uh, maybe let me not just test that just yet. Let me go to something smaller. Like, you know, if you... I don't know. Uh, what, what small promises do you know? Come on, guys. You've got favorite, favorite verses. Favorite verses. Promise. A promise that you know from God. Yes, ma'am. Sorry? Yes, before you ask, I have already given that. Uh, Tasha Cobbs has a wonderful song called Immediately. 
I love that song. She says, just when I get on my knees and I'm asking God for help, immediately God works it out. Yes, my man. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Amazing. Anyone else got a scripture that they know? Like your go-to scripture. I'm surprised no one has quoted Psalms yet. <laughs> Whoa. Okay, anyway. Um, so we all have these verses that we go to that really sort of help us uh, through uh, the experiences we go through. Um, however, there are obstacles to these promises. There's obstacles. And that's why as we age, age brings wisdom, experience, a.k.a. cynicism. Because you've, you've seen stuff, right? You've had scars. You've kind of like you've been disappointed before. You've done it all. Number one is worry. God says do not worry. Number two is negativity. God says do not think negative thoughts. Jeremiah 29, 11, I myself as God have good thoughts towards you. What gives you the right to think negatively? Number three, doubt. Do not doubt. Do not doubt. And we know the danger with these, and I'm explaining to you the danger with this. Number one, worry. What do we see on the, on, the, on the board there? Can we see? What are you seeing? We're seeing a chase. We're seeing lunch. We're thinking of lunch yet? Dinner? Okay, so very quickly, the reason God says to us don't worry is because we aren't the same with animals. We're different to animals. One moment a springbok or a gazelle, pick any deer, is being chased, right? Five minutes later, when, it's, when the danger's clear, it's peaceful with the rest of the flock, and it's grazing again and drinking water, like nothing happened. But human beings have one close shave, and you're thinking about it for the next two months. It keeps running over and over and over and over and over and over. And God is saying, I don't want you to do that. Now, the thing about staying in constant chase mode or constant I am going to be the prey mode, which is worry, is because three things happen when a gazelle is being chased by an animal. Number one, it wants to protect its physical body. That's why it's running away with it as, as, possibly, as, as fast as it possibly could with its life. It wants to protect its body. It's in a fight or flee instinct. So that's number one. Number two, um, the animal is mindful about the space. It's looking, where could I possibly run into? Where could I hide? Where could I confuse the leopard or the cheetah that's behind me? So it's, it's, it's prancing for its life, but meanwhile it's looking around. Where could I pl find a place of safety? And then number three is time. It's thinking, the, the snorting I hear behind my back, it's only 30 seconds before I hear, I, I feel a big paw swipe my, my left hind leg. And you've seen these videos before, isn't it? So body, space and time and consistently in this mindset it becomes difficult to accept god's promises or to even be creative because number one we're thinking of our body we're stressed about an illness that the doctor has said so the body is the main concern and we're stressed about it the mind sort of shuts down. Number two, we're looking at the environment. What are people going to say about me with this thing I have? I'm comparing my health to that person, and that person is so well, and the environment begins to affect me. Number three, how much time do I have to live? How much time do I have between now and when I'm going to be better? How much time do I have between now when I'm so poor and when I'm going to be eventually wealthy? Oh, by the way, the time is running out. I'm 30 years old now. I wish I could have been 20, a bit more time. And those three things begin to circle the mind and you are an animal that's within the uh, 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 target site of its prey consistently, and that's what worry does to us. In that mode, we fail to be like the creator. We cannot create in our minds. We cannot see the promise of God. We cannot be kind to the next person. We cannot reach out and be able to say the word of God says this, therefore I am. We have a limited sense of identity because of consistently worrying. And that is the danger with worry. We're always under threat. Number two, negativity. We know the parable of the talents somewhere in the Bible. One guy was given how many talents? Let's go, guys. How many? There were three people, right? Okay, I want my people at the back right there. Can you see me? Wonderful. Talents. How many talents? One. And then the next one? Two or three. Guys, come on. Hey. Do you want us to ask the little girl, Noni, to come and just, you know, like break it down for you all? <laughs> okay. How many talents? He got three talents. And then the next guy got five talents. The guy who got the one talent, absolutely thoroughly negative. He says, I knew you were a hard master, isn't it? 
and that you always reap where you've not sown. So I didn't do anything about it. Absolutely negative. N ignoring the fact that, number one, he's been given a talent. Number two, he was a servant, so he was on a salary. Number three, there was the opportunity to trade and become something of himself. And number four, really more importantly, he had a lot less stress and headache than the guy who had. But he chose to see the negative point. And because of that, he was cast out into the, where there is gnashing of teeth and everything else. Negativity will drag you down. If you look for negativity in any circumstance, you'll find it. You will find it. Uh, no need to stress that point. And number three, doubt. Doubt. I can't do it. I, I, I wish I could. I can't. Because in a lot of ways, God calls us to jump. And sometimes the jump is, I can't see where I'm going, therefore I... Some of the animals that we know that are put in an enclosure the gazelle being the first example. The gazelle can jump, I'm forgetting the meters, but it can jump close to maybe around four meters thereabouts in, in, in height, like when it's being chased. But the fence that it is enclosed within is usually a 1.5 meter fence. You know why? It has a rule in its life. It never jumps where it will not see where it's going to land. So the devil puts up a 1.5 meter fence around you, and you're like, that's it, I'm done. God knows, meanwhile, you can jump four meters. Let's get into Scripture. Last week we had a lot of Scripture. This week we only have two verses, and then we've got a lot more stories to tell. Uh, Old Testament. 2 Peter 1 verse 4. His divine power. This is easily the most important verse in my life, and I hope that it will be something that you are able to also work with. Because you're asking yourself, what is this promise, and why does God want us to think good thoughts? The real reason is because we are in a movie and God gives us the chance to become actors in our own rights and not just participators. And, sorry, not just uh, as spectators. 2 Peter 1 verse 4. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and His goodness. His glory and His goodness. This is what they do. Through these things, through his glory and his goodness, he has given us his very, guys, let's read it together, and promises. So God's promises are not just promises. If, 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 if I took on the local, local link, I'd say they're not just promises in J. You know, it's not just like, that's a promise, and, but it's, they are great and they are. Have you ever looked at God's promises and God's word like that? Like it's treasure. God says they are great and they are precious. Anyway, so that through them you may, let's read it together, in the, and then in this battle where the odds are really against us, what will happen? You can find an escape route. 2 Peter 1 verse 4. I love this verse. And what it literally tells me is, there's a movie playing out here on earth. And the movie on earth is the devil's been thrown here, and we were here, and stuff is going on. We've got a bold and a beautiful. We've got name any Netflix series you want where there's conflict. That's what's happening down here on earth. And the people in heaven are staring and looking down at us, thinking, hmm, what's going to happen today when he gets tempted? What's going to happen today? Is he going to embarrass us? Is he going to make it? Is he going to make a stand? Is this the day today that he finally claims his right as the proper son of God? And everyone's watching. And God is saying, I'm giving you these promises so that you may participate in the divine nature. So God is giving you a chance to be able to become an actor in the life that we live. So you're going to hear this. What can I do about life? You know, the, the odds are stacked against us. The economy is haywire. Zuma did what he wanted with it. At the workplace, my boss is doing what he wants. Um, they're probably about to retrench a couple of people right now. My wife doesn't think that much of me. My kids, they're just haywire. And the whole big story of helplessness. God is saying, I want you to become a participator in the divine nature. So God is plotting out this whole plan and he's saying, Hey, psst, Kevin, 
You want to play partners? And you're like, uh, yeah, I want to. And God is like, here's, how, here's what you're going to do. Here's a whole toolbox of promises. Use whichever works for you so that we're able to craft this thing together and become co-creators together. Does that make sense? Last week we spoke about the movie 300, isn't it? Remember that? Still one of my favorite movies. But there's another 300 in the Bible. There's a guy called Gideon. Still speaking about the things that affect God's promises in our minds. Worry, negativity, and doubt or fear. So, the Israelites, at some point, this is from the book of Judges. Judges chapter 3. The Israelites, no, chapter 2. Israelites had a great life, successful, the bills were paid, the fridge was full, the pool is cleaned, it's got enough chlorine, kids running all over at private schools, life is good, lean back, sit back and sit on the huge, huge couch and just enjoy. Sip whatever you could sip that, you know, possibly is proper for us. But you know what usually happens when you're in that stage? We tend to forget God, and that's exactly what they did. They didn't have devotion with God, didn't thank God, didn't put God first, left out stuff that was supposed to be done, didn't give to the poor, didn't give back to tithe, weren't involved in church because life is good. And God says, okay, I'm going to remove my protection and let things happen. As it would happen, the Midianites, where their enemies begin to raid them consistently. And they raided them and they raided them. And the Bible makes this very clear, that when they came to raid the, raid the Israelites, they came like it was a massive fair. You've seen like the Route 44 market, where it's just like full of people. Um, my wife usually laughs at me because I'm learning Afrikaans. It's a proper diamakar of people, right? Like all of this stuff is just happening. There's people all over. And the Bible says this is what they do. They bring their camp, they bring their tents, they bring their wives, they bring their children, they bring their cattle, everything, and they'd come to camp to raid the Israelites. And they just thoroughly enjoyed it. It was a free for all. Like, oh, I like, I like that gown, take it. Oh, I like this. It's like a shopping spree, only it's free. And so this happened consistently, consistently, until the Israelites were thoroughly, thoroughly ravaged to the point where the guy in the story is supposed to be processing his wheat or threshing his wheat, but he can't do it in the open because the moment he does it, the Midianites would come and they'd just take whatever it is. And, and they did it so much until the Bible records the Israelites did not have any livestock and they had no grain whatsoever. So... He is in a wine press, which is really, you know, hidden away, and it's totally covered. And in the wine press is this huge, ro huge stone that you sort of need to push so that it can crush grapes. That's what he's using to crush his wheat. Because he's trying to do it away from the Midianites, who would then come over and just take over everything. While he's doing that, an angel appears. Before that, the Israelites had cried out to the Lord, and like, Lord, save us. And God had sent a prophet, and the prophet said, you guys ignored me. But God being God is like, okay, I'm going to do something about it. Comes over, goes to a guy called Gideon. Gideon is the, is, is the last guy in the family, and he's also from the tribe that's the smallest. And while he's there threshing his wheat in, in the wine press, the angel comes to him and says, listen, Gideon, beloved of the Lord, mighty man of valor. And he's like, you talking to me? And the angel says, like, yeah, I'm talking to you. The guy's like, whoa, wait a minute. What do you mean God is with us? Do you not see What's going on right now? How could it be that God is with us? Doubt. And the angel says to him, listen, um, you are going to conquer the Midianites through your hand, and this is what I need you to do. And he's like, okay, fine, what do you need me to do? He says, okay, listen, there's the, uh, there's the altar of Baal that you guys have put up. I need you to go to that altar and break it down. It's got some wooden poles. Chop those wooden poles down and take the chosen bull that your dad prizes and cut that, put that on the altar and sacrifice to me. The Bible makes it very clear. Gideon was afraid that night and he was like, oof, I can't really do it during the day when everyone's watching. In the evening he goes and he does it, slices it up. The next morning everybody wakes up like, whoa, who did this to Baal? Who... And then the amazing part of the story is he is defended by his father and the next day the spirit is on him and he rallies up 35,000 men for them to go and, and, uh, 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 and attack the Midianites who clearly were now on call for them to, be, uh, to come through and just raid through uh, Israel. The story fast tracks very quickly and I want you to go back home and just read it. At the end, you've got a battle scene where initially there were 35,000 men to 135,000 Midianites. So you can see the proportion there is very fair, right? 
135 and just 35,000. And God says, I'm going to save you with these men. They get there, then God says to Gideon, tell these men, whoever feels afraid, tell them to go back home. 25,000 of them drop back. I'm like, okay, I'm afraid. I'm not going. I'm okay. I, I, and they drop back. He's left with 10,000. He's like, okay, God, should 10,000 work? And God says, no, actually, uh, tell them to, to all go and drink water, and I'll tell you something. So the guys get there, and they drink water, and then there's two things. There's one team that drinks water alert, and they're lapping it up, like, and they got their sword and everything else, and they're lapping it up. And then there's the other team that just thinks, you know what, life is cool. You know what, let's, let's go all the way, and let's just, uh, uh, let's just chill. Uh, oh. Ah, oh, this is all right. Uh, and God says, listen, for all the guys that actually slept on the floor, tell them to go back. Now, if you were a movie director, you would have seen Gideon's jaw drop to the floor. He's like, whoa, 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 God, I, I know you can do miracles, but wait a minute. Because the only people who were taking up the water alert were 300. So I, are you... I, are you trying to tell me you're going to choose people to go to war on how they drink water? Like, can you imagine if, if people to preach here or people to serve in church were chosen by how they drank water? Like, what's that got to do with warfare? Like, how does that even work? But God says, trust me, the reason I'm doing this is because when we get the victory, I don't want anyone tomorrow saying we did it because of our numbers or our own ability. I want you to know very well that you did it because of me as God. So in the end, we hear that there's 300 people. And that picture you see up there is Gideon. And Gideon says, God, I know we've gone this far, but I am worried. I am so, so worried. Could you just do one more thing for me? And God says, what is it? He says, listen, I'm going to take a piece of wool and I'm going to put it on uh, the thresh threshing floor. And the next morning, I'd like that the wool would be wet, but the ground around it be dry. And God says, okay, sure. The next morning he goes there, picks up the, uh, a piece of wool, and the Bible says he rings it up and he fills a cup with the moisture. And he's like, whoa, okay, this is real. Um, they says, okay, God, wait, 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 just one more thing. Could we reverse the scenario? Like the next morning, could the ground be wet and the fleece itself be dry? And God is like, okay, you're pushing it, but we'll do it. Fine. The next morning he gets there and everything else is wet, but that piece is dry. And he still is like, I'm not sure, God, I'm not sure. God says, okay, fine, listen, here's one last one. If you are doubting and if you're fearful, God actually puts it out there. I need you to go down to the Midianite camp, and what you'll hear there will change you. So he takes one guy to go down, go down to the Midianite camp, and there's people parting. Remember, the Midianites have come to raid, and one guy's like, listen, last night I dreamt I was worried, man. There was a huge loaf of barley that came tumbling down, and it knocked the tent with so much force. And the other guy says, what do you think this is? And the other guy's like, mm, this must be Gideon and his man. They're going to destroy us. The Bible says that very moment, it's almost like there was a spring jump in Gideon. He's like, okay, God, I get it. This is really going to happen. He goes back, rouses up everyone. He's like, guys, let's get the heck out of here. Let's go and attack. The Bible says they went there. Remember, it's just how many men? 300. And he says you split them into three. And there's something that's extremely important that I need to touch on. God didn't tell him what to do. Remember the verse? Okay, I was supposed to, looks like I flipped back. Please help me. The verse says, become participators in the divine. This is what God is talking about. God is saying, I'm not going to fill in all the blanks for you. But the moment you become confident, the moment you start believing me that I'm capable, I am going to mandate you to be creative in the circumstances of your life based on my promise. So it's like, okay, there's only 300 of us. Let's split and let's become three. One team in the middle, one at the end, one at the end, count formation, whatever it is. And when we get there, we're going to hold up our, our trumpets, We'll hold up a lamp, and we'll all carry an empty jar, cistern, whatever it is. And when they get to the place, this is what they do. He shouts for God and for Gideon. I'm sure the guy also had to put his name there, you know, just like, just like, there, like I'm, I'm, I'm with God, I'm working. He says for God and for Gideon, and immediately they smash all the jars, immediately. In one amazing noise, and with that shout and with the lights, the Bible says God threw the Midianite camp into thorough confusion. And that night, thousands and thousands of people killed each other on that place. And so God brought victory for the Israelites through Gideon. In this story, there's worry, there's doubt, there's negativity. But because of God's promises and because of God's assurances, 
And sometimes the assurance to you might be through an SMS, a friend saying something. Has that ever happened to you? Extremely discouraged, you're thinking this is it, and an SMS ding, comes in, you read it, and you're like, oh. you have no doubt in your mind, you know it was for you. Someone else will read it and they're like, oh, what is this? This doesn't make sense. This is blah, 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 blah. Those are the part of the people who were drinking the water lying on the floor. It's not for them, but it's for you. And you can't run away from it because somehow it's fixed you in. And God works like that with us. And God is saying, I want you to get over worry. I want you to get over doubt. And I want you to get over negativity because it's extremely important that we move together. Now, as you're doing this, you're asking yourself, having to rely on God and His promises without a plan B, is not an easy thing to do. Having to, I'll repeat that. Having to rely on God and His promises without a plan B is not an easy thing to do because we're grown up. Like, we make plans, right? Let's have a plan B. If God doesn't come through, this is what we're going to do. Faith, once fulfilled, becomes a fact. The reason we stay away from faith is because, according to Hebrews 11, faith is... Guys, let's go. Let's go. Faith is... Faith is the evidence of things un. What else is faith? What else is faith? The substance, like the way that the guys are writing is kind of like crazy, right? The substance of things hoped for. It's not there yet. But did it ever occur to you, and this is what hit me, faith remains faith before it's fulfilled. But once it's fulfilled and the thing happens, it becomes a fact. Case in point, Peter. It's not possible to walk on water, right? But do you think if we resurrected Peter today and told him, listen, Peter, it's impossible. Do you think he'd agree with you? Because for him, it's a fact. Tell Gideon, you have 300 men. It's impossible to fight an army of 135,000 with 300 men. He'd be like, actually, you know what? Uh, I don't want to burst your bubble, but actually, uh, it's possible. So what makes faith so difficult for us is we haven't gotten to the point where it's been realized just yet. Easy examples. Speak to young people who are being told about marriage. They're like, ah, I don't want to get married. Marriage is tough, buddy. Woo. I don't want to get married. Also, people who are married are like, listen, it's tough, but it's actually worth it. And then they'll explain certain things to you. For them, it's no longer a faith thing. They've been there, done that. Uh, sorry, been there, done that. Speak to someone who's trying to start a business. They'll be like, hey, it's tough, man. The conditions are tough. The economy is down. We have a recession coming through. Speak to an experienced businessman. They'll be like, actually, that's the best, the best time to start the business. It's going to groom you. It's going to do this. And this is what I did with my business. For him, it's no longer a fact. It's, it's no longer faith. It's a fact. This is our last slide, and then we'll tell a story, and then we close. Um, God really wants, God really wants you to put Him first in your thoughts, and when it comes to the promises, I need to illustrate to you why it's important for us to be in the right state of mind. A certain businessman was going in the red, was already in the red. Things were not well for him. And if you've been in business before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, bills unpaid, everything's piling up, the wife is complaining, kids' school fees not attended to, things are just not going the way they should be. And this guy's thinking of winding down his business and he's like, I'm not sure what to do after this. The guy sitting in a park and he's extremely stressed because he owes and he owes and he owes, he owes, he owes, he owes. He owes call it a hundred, couple of hundred thousand of rand, and he's in the red, and he's thinking, what should I do? While he's busy thinking this way, there's an elderly man who comes over to him, pats him by the shoulder, he turns, looks up at him, and the elderly man says, listen, um, I've been there before, and I can see what you're going through. Here's something for you. And the guy hands him a 200,000 rand check, says, here's something for you. And he walks away. Now, he's busy holding the check. He can't believe what this, what's had to stand. By the time he turns around to look at his benefactor, the benefactor has disappeared and gone. Now, he holds on to this check and is like, okay, what am I going to do? And all of a sudden, him, he now has a positive mindset like, wow, I could pay off my debts. Amazing. I could. But then something strikes and he's like, but wait a minute. 
I have the money. What if I try to hustle my way out of the stuff, knowing full well that I have the money? So he goes back to all the people he owes and he says, listen, I want to work, I want to work on a payment plan with you. I'm going to pay you this amount, and then they wrangle and haggle, and they argue and everything else, but he walks out of all those meetings with some form of laid-out agreement. He goes to his supplier, and he's like, listen, mate, um, I'm going to pay you. I've got the money. The supplier looks at him and is like, what do you mean you've got the money? You haven't paid me. He's like, listen, trust me. Trust me. I know exactly what I'm talking about. And the, something in his demeanor, the confidence he has because the check in his back pocket convinces the supplier. Supplier gives him the goods. He trades, gets the money, pays off all his debtors, etc., Eight months after he's out and he's in the blue again, he decides to take a walk in the park and he's like, listen, if I could find that old man, I can actually write him back his check and be like, dude, <laughs> you have no idea what you did for me. He goes to the park, lingers around. First day, nothing happens. Second day, nothing happens. Third day, nothing happens. Fourth day, he sees the old man. He gets up, you know, like, you, I, you've done so much for me. The old man's walking towards him and he's, he's like, wow. I need to just gush over and just let you know what you did for me. And as the man walks closer and closer and closer to him, very quickly, there's some nurses who come over like, hey, Mr. Williams, Mr. Williams, you shouldn't be outside. And then they pull, uh, then they push out a, 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 a wheelchair right underneath his foot, just like the one I have to my left ear. He sits in and they're like, whew. So they turn to the man and they're like, listen, I'm really sorry. I hope Mr. Wilson hasn't been bothering you. And the guy's like, no, 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 no. I, I need to talk to him. And the guy's like, no, 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 listen, sorry. You don't understand. Mr. Wilson is mentally deranged. He has this habit of passing out checks to strangers every morning, and these checks are just, they dud checks. I'm, I'm really sorry, I hope he didn't give you one. What changed in the story? It's the mindset. Fire to rewire. I'll close with this. One habit at a time. Benjamin Franklin had this thing. Because I need to rewire my brain, he would write down a list of things that he wants to become better at or change in. And all he'd do is he'd focus on one habit for the week. If the, if the habit is gratefulness, Glenn preached a wonderful sermon on gratefulness the last time. If the habit is gratefulness that I'm trying to nurture, he would focus on that for a whole week. The next habit would be abundance. I want to practice an abundance mindset that the things are there, the, the promises are there. Next week is abundance. Third week, I want to practice thoughtfulness. I want to be thoughtful. I want to put other people before me and then put all these traits and quickly come back to them consistently, consistently. Right now, I'm on a seven-day program and I've done one each for each day. Yesterday was thoughtfulness and being romantic. I sent out a message to my wife and she's like, why did you send me that message? And now she knows. One habit at a time. And it allows you to focus on the one thing. Look at your life. Map it out. What are the things you wish you could do, which you know are important for you to adopt mentally? And put it down and think about it on a daily basis and try and stick to it. It could be just being punctual. It could be sticking to your word. Just being a guy or a woman who when I say I'm going to do something, I will do it. Number two, affirmations. Before you wake up in the morning and open your eyes, while you, your eyes are still closed, affirm yourself. Tell yourself who you are. Run through one or two of God's most important promises in your life. Run it through six, seven times until you feel it's deep down there. Then open your eyes to meet the world. And the reason I'm saying this is because the world is wired with all its many environmental things, which we're used to. You know, when you wake up, you need to greet the wife, you need to see, see to the kids, you need to make breakfast, and it all goes around the same way, and it doesn't do much to help your brain. But if you reset the affirmation, it helps you. And then number three is think different. Number three is think different. Plan your day and say, this is how I want to start the day. This is how I want to stay positive regardless of what happens, and that will immensely, thoroughly help you. Um, I'm two minutes over my time, but I'm quickly going to close with this. And then I'll ask for us to pray. During my, uh, the country I was in, there's something called the fourth form. Uh, and in the fourth form, um, you then move over to the fifth and sixth form, which then eventually take you over to university. 
Um, I was a prefect in my school, um, one of those people who is kind of respected and supposed to be doing things the proper way. Now, the school I was in was a, a school for highly intelligent people, and you needed to have what's called four A's. An A is 75% and upwards in your exams. Um, I achieved three A's, not four, but a string of four B's after that. So it's kind of like, man, like I, I nearly was there four times, I couldn't. And uh, I therefore didn't get a place to progress to the fifth form and the sixth form. Uh, the letter came, regret, ETC. Um, and I was sitting back there, and my dad says to me, what are you going to do? And the promise of God sprung in my head. I was like, you know what? This is not how my life is going to end. I refuse that I would end in this dump, in this ditch, eventually find a job, but just not make it the way I think it ought to be. And I remember getting down, praying in the corner of the house um, at 7 o'clock, when everyone else is watching the series that they thoroughly love, that's the time I take out to go to pray and be like, God, I need you to change my life. Something has to change. I can't have missed it by just as much. The next morning, they were opening up the school to admit the people who were going to the fifth form and sixth form. Um, I walked up to my dad and I said, Dad, could I have bus fare? And my father said to me, where are you going? I said, I'm going to school. I've got a place there. And my dad didn't argue with me, uh, produced the money from his pocket, gave it to me. I took the money, quickly took a bus, got into the bus, shuttled off to this town where the school was. When I got there, there's this forest that you walk through. And since my first form to the fourth form, every time the parents would pass by that place, um, because my dad lost his job when I was in the second form, so we lost the car. So they actually had to walk to our place. And every time they'd walk to, through that place, there's a certain spot my dad would say, let's kneel down and let's pray. Now, it, you're, you're like 12, 13, 14 years old, and your dad's asking you to kneel down in the forest. It's like, like, what are you doing? Like, this is not the right place. And then just a few meters, there's people walking. You know, like, Dad, why would you? On that particular day when I was going back to try and faith my place, myself, into a place, I knelt by the very same place, and I said, God, We've prayed before in this place. I need you today. I need you to open up a door for me. I have no idea what it is. I'm jumping, but I'm trusting that you'll catch me. I stood up, dusted my knees, then walked off to the place. Got to the school, opened up the place, saw the headmaster. The headmaster looked at me and said, listen, aren't you the guy who got the three A's and the four B's? I'm like, I'm the one. He says, listen, you've got no place here. I only want four, four A's and upwards. He walked and closed the door. And I'm left there sweating and thinking, oh, whoa, um, wow. And then something in me broke, and I was like, no, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving, God. I'm relying on your promise. I don't know what he's saying, what he's doing, but I know that you're bigger and greater than, than this entire institution. I need a place, and I'm waiting here, and I said. The next person who walked past was the um, senior master. Now, he walks past me, and he's like, hey, Cliff. I'm like, sir, how are you? He says, what are you doing here? I'm like, okay, not again. Um, and I'm like, no, I'm here to look for a place, sir. And he says to me, do you know that me and your dad used to be friends? Do you know that me and your dad used to live in the same place while we're still trying to find our feet in our first jobs? I'm like, yeah, I think he told me about that story. He says, your dad was really good to me. You know what? Come. So I stand up and he says, let's get into the hall. We get into the hall. We walk all the way through all these people. Everyone else who had four A's and five A's. And we're walking down. We get to the place. And he says, listen, um, please organize a place for this guy so that he can join the institution. And I'm standing there, and I'm like, whoa, okay. So they ask me, what combination do you want to do? I'm like, okay, I want to do this subject, and that subject, and that subject. And I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, your, your marks aren't really bad. Yeah, sure. You can have this and that and that and that. And then I was given the form. I went down. I sat down. I filled it in, and I looked around the room, and everyone else looked at me that looked like, ah, yeah, welcome, man. Welcome, buddy. What's up? And I filled it, and I gave it back, and that's how I got to be in the sixth and seventh, uh, fifth and sixth form. The story when I went to university, exactly the same thing. University, I'd gotten enough points to get there, but uh, there was corruption, that I can clearly say. Um, and I didn't have anyone who was a connection like I had the previous time. And this time, there was nobody else. One lady walks into the office. I'd been there since Monday. It was on a Friday. I'm giving up because Friday is the deadline. She walks in and she's like, listen, I've seen you here every single time. What do you want? I'm like, I'm looking for a place for varsity. I have, these, I have this many marks, and I clearly qualify. And she says, stand up. So I stand up, and she says to me, hmm, can you play basketball? I'm like, yeah, I used to play basketball, but because of Saturday, I couldn't, you know, like, continue all the time. She says, you've got good height. Are you sure you can play basketball? I'm like, yeah, I can play basketball. She's like, follow me. I followed her. We went straight to uh, Register General's office. We got there. She said, wait here, close the door. She argued with the Register General. I, I could remember very vividly, two minutes, there were voices were high, they were shouting, and she 
opened the door, shut it in, my, in, in the Rachel General's face, walked close to me and she said, check for your name in the Sunday newspaper. You'll be there under the supplementary list. And that's how I got to have my first degree. The fact that I, too, I looked tall enough to be a basketball player. And these are things that God has done for me. I would not be here with you guys here sharing this message, having moved to Cape Town, having married my wife, having met my wonderful mother-in-law. I would not be here if God had not helped me through those very important, crucial moments in my life for my education. That wouldn't have happened. But it was because somehow I refused and I said, the promise says, Mark eleven twenty eight, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe them and you shall surely receive them. May the Lord bless the reading of his word.